Amen. Well, I want to welcome everyone here to the Log Church, everyone here, and also down at the cafe. And I want to do a little something here. Now, if I have uh, the cameras help me a little bit, I have a couple that I'd like to stand. Frank and Carol Maroos, right in the back. If I have you stand, this week, weekend is their 50th wedding anniversary. And uh, praise God. Amen. Amen. Good. Uh, that's Dr. Maroos. And uh, we have many people that have mental problems in the church, and you should set up an appointment with him, okay? So instead of the pastors, he could help you better. That was awful, okay? I'm sorry. Here we go. Um, all right, you know, this uh, week here, uh, you know, the pastors asked me if um, I did not want to bring this sermon. And I said, no, I want to bring it. I do. And, uh, and I want to let you know, I've actually been very, very good uh, over this last year. I truly, I have not opened my mouth about the election or the candidates. I've not even joked about it. Pastor Sam has told all the jokes. He has all the jokes on the candidates. Uh, I just come up with the pictures, okay? So that's all. I thought it was very fitting for the two of them. Um, I don't know. Let me ask you, is there anybody here that would say, I am so sick and tired of hearing about the election? Anybody? Amen. Amen. I am too. So I'm kind of glad it's all going to come to an end this week, but I hope it's not the beginning of the end, okay? Um, Now, Also, when we're looking at people that are running for public office like this, um, they all make all sorts of false promises, don't they? They really do. It's like a a sophisticated game of play dog. You know how you play dog? You, um, you uh, You get a ball, and you throw it out, and the dog catches a ball, and then you start faking them out. You act like you threw the ball, and the dog goes running out in the field looking for the ball. That's the American people looking for the promises that they gave us. I know it's, got a, it's like a, a divine Easter egg hunt or something, you know? But it doesn't really come. And uh, hey, do you remember, last, remember the last time around how upset we were about Obamacare? Remember that? Okay, so there was all sorts, you know, is it going to work or is it not going to work? And most people I know stood against it. But let me ask you, do I have anybody here or down at the cafe that would be, let's be up front, I'm there too, that you're like, I have someone in my home it might be you, that really are dependent upon their health care. Raise your hand right now, right now. Just raise your hands. Go everywhere. Truly, put your hands up. Okay, good. All right, so when Obamacare got started out, all of a sudden, there were those, uh, you know, let's do the sophisticated play dog game, and they threw some things out in the field. So we thought, well, we can't stop this. So, you know, maybe we could enjoy it. Maybe, maybe something might come good out of this, even though it's like a tidal wave because we can't stop what was happening. So... So I, deep down inside, I didn't want to admit it, but I thought, well, you know, maybe, because we, we have all sorts of health care issues. And um, so it was going along. Of course, now it's a train wreck. So I don't know if you've seen it. Uh, my wife and I, and my wife is absolutely dependent. She has um, two machines, and I don't say a whole lot about this, but she has a type 1 diabetic. But she's not just type 1. She is a crazy, off-the-charts, brittle diabetic. And what that means is her body does not produce any insulin. I mean, no insulin. So uh, even though we can look at diets and things such as that, this is not type 2. That's a different beast. And uh, so, so what it is is uh, she has a machine on her that uh, pumps insulin into her body 24 hours a day. So, like in the middle of the night, we were having major emergencies uh, because their sugar was going crazy. And so, it's like a little computer that, you know, knows how much to put in at each hour throughout the day, even when you're sleeping. Well, then we had to get a second machine, and the second machine is another IV. She has, this first one's an IV, and the other one's a second IV. She has to put these two in every three days, uh, and it's the emergency machine. So, what it does is when her sugar is going off the charts or going flatlining, it sends emergency alarms to our cell phones. And the, the, the alarms will go off and it'll tell us exactly where her sugar is. And we've you know, got to get to her to help her because it has affected her that she can't think when it happens. She can't think what to do because of what it has now done to her. So, but God is good. I mean, she did flatline at zero like two weeks ago. And we had people helping me with her from the office. And, uh, but, but God is good, and she's all right. Everything's fine. But, I mean, she can't live without this. And so uh, we get a letter the other day. And just to inform us uh, that our insurance policy is going up 
$1,000 a month. A month. I mean, that's like a crime, isn't it? I mean, how do you shoot somebody? So last night she says to me, what are we going to do? Well, being the serious person I am, I said, dude, do not worry, honey. I said, what I'm going to do is we got a new family doctor. We won't have to worry about this. His name is Dr. Kevorkian. <laughs> That's awful. I know. I'm sorry. That's really horrible. <laughs> Nothing serious in my house, okay? Oh, we'll deal with that when it comes, okay? So here we go. We have two candidates in which, we, which both of them are morally disqualified. They're both very bad public images. In fact, I'm not even really sure if they get any worse. For the first time in American history, we do not have one good moral standing public figure with a decent, half decent, kind of decent behavior if it's from committing crimes that should put you in jail, or it's being belligerent and uh, just off the charts ignorant when it comes to the morality with men and women. Okay, so we're just going to stop right there. Now, as a church, uh, it is against the law for us to uh, publicly push any um, candidate to be voted for. So, uh, and I hate politics. I'm going to be fine. I, I don't like politics. I don't. If I thought that politics would save the world, then I would have become a politician and not a preacher. Jesus saves the world. But the problem which we're having today is that the church is silent. Now, back in the 70s, uh, Dr. Jerry Falwell formed what was known as the moral majority. And what they did they went out to Americans across the United States and said, if you believe in the family, if you believe in the sanctity of life, if you believe that God had purposed for uh, Adam to marry Eve and not for Adam to marry Steve, if you believe in religious freedom, if you believe in all the things that America was built upon, then join the moral majority, and we are going to find a public figure whose policies most reflect or look in the light of what we find in God's Word. Moral majority, just study history yourself, look this up, you can look behind me on this, was singly responsible for getting Ronald Reagan in the office and keeping him there for two terms. Now, Ronald Reagan, when he went into office, the big deal, if you remember, in the later 70s, was Ronald Reagan was divorced. The question in that day was, could the American people uh, vote for a man who 30 years before, 30 years before, had been just known as a womanizer and had been divorced? Should we put a divorced man in public office as president of the United States? Well, we've come a long ways from there, haven't we? We are on such a downhill slide in the last 30 years that there's no end, end to the depths of the filth of immorality. And now what is accepted by the public in America is in trouble. And I'm saying America is in trouble with God. America has only been blessed because God is being in control. America hasn't been blessed because America is a Christian nation, but America has followed Christian values and the atmosphere of that which relates to his will and the atmosphere and the temperature of morality when it comes to the values we find in the word of God. And, and that, that is for sure, and that, that's not even to be argued anywhere. Daniel chapter 4, verse 17, is we're looking because uh, we have to make a choice between two heathens, two pagans, in which we'd like to have in public office. It says, uh, this matter, talking about public matters of um, government, by the decree of the, what's that word? Okay, so there's watchers in heaven. They watch politics and leaders. It says, in the demand by the word of the holy ones, that's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, 
They're guiding and directing the watchers, and the watchers repeat, report to them. To the intent, okay, this is what the intent is, ready? That the living, that's us, all believers, all people, the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom. He ruleth in the United States of men. And he giveth to whomever he will. Now, back in the Old Testament, the people wanted a king. God said, I don't want you to be a king. God had his, his man that would rule in the nation and guide them. They said, no, we want to be like the other kingdoms. We want a king. We want somebody that's good looking. We want a warrior. We want somebody who's tall. We want somebody who's winsome. And God gave them a king. And his name was, anybody know? Saul, King Saul. God chose Saul. God didn't want Saul. It wasn't good they received Saul. But they received Saul, and God judged the nation of Israel with the presence of having King Saul. Very, very sad. Why is it we only have these two candidates to choose from? Uh, we're not going to get into all the names. We're not getting into that. But uh, we had some men that were running as candidates of the United States that had wonderful public testimony that stood for all the things that America should stand for, has stood for, that we would agree with if they were believers or not. But on top of that, they were even believers. But they weren't cool enough. They weren't, they weren't that winsome, strong public speaker. They weren't quick enough. Because they weren't appealing to our ears and our eyes, we rejected them. So God has given us the two candidates in which we have. So we really need to pray for the election. I do believe that God can still bless America. I still believe that we're sliding to the end of Jesus returning, if it would be tonight or in 40 years, but I know that that is coming. Uh, that's why I do not get upset about politics. I am a citizen of heaven, and then I'm a citizen of earth. I am a child of God, and then I am a citizen of the United States. And so we always got to get things in the proper order. Um, in 2012, 25 million Americans that identified themselves as being Christians decided not to vote even though they were registered to vote. I want you to imagine, 25 million Christians decided not to vote. Why? Same reason many of you have decided not to vote. We're so disgusted. We don't like this one. We don't like that one. And they have just thrown the towel in on this. Reminds me of the man that was in a pit. He fell in a pit, and as he's down in a pit yelling for help, a very emotional man came along, and he said, you know, I feel really bad that you're down here in the pit, and he started to cry, and he walked away. Then a judgmental man came to the pit, and he said, well, the reason why you're in the pit is you probably deserve to be in the pit. Okay, then he went away. Then another a reporter came along, and he said, well, I want to do a story of you being stuck in the pit. And then an IRS man came along and looked in the pit and says, I want to know if you're paying taxes in the pit. Okay, then uh, a self-centered person came along and said, wow, I know you're in the pit, but you should see my pit. My pit's worse than your pit. And he walked away. Then a doctor came along. It was Dr. Maroos. And Dr. Maroos came along because he counsels people. And he said, the reason why you're in the pit is because it's your parents' fault that you're in the pit. Okay, then an optimist came along and said, oh, I know it's really bad in the pit, but it can't get any worse than being in the pit. And then a negative person, pessimist, came along and said, you're in the pit and it's going to get worse. Then Jesus came along, put his hand in, and pulled the man out of the pit. We have fallen into a rut in our own personal lives, and usually our personal lives reflect our public lives. I'm not going to do anything because I feel that the little bit in which I can do is not going to make an effect. Or we're in a fight, and we say, well, I don't like the choices in which I have here, so I'm just going to give in, and whatever happens, happens. That is not the attitude or the thinking or the philosophy of a born-again Christian, of anybody who knows God, or anyone who expects to get something done. In Romans chapter 13, verse 1, it says, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. Okay, that's our government. Word is subject to them. There is no authority except that which God hath established. So if the authority that is over us, uh, we've been judged with, or he's blessing us with, we are to obey them. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Being a citizen of the United States is an office. And it has been designed by our government that it is my duty to go to the polls on Tuesday 
and to vote. And you need to vote what you believe. And you need to take your beliefs to the polls, whatever that belief may be. Do you remember the, um, most of you won't, but some of you will, Steelers Wheel. Remember them in the 70s, that rock group? Okay, I, I never talk about these people. This, I couldn't pass this one up. 1972, they came out with this song, uh, and, and he says, hey, in the song, hey, we, we don't know what to do. We're, we're really in a mess here. And he says, uh, clowns are to the left of me, jokers to the right, and here I am stuck in the middle with you. Well, that's where we are, right? We're stuck in the middle of a joker and a clown. And it is what it is. Okay, so we have to forget the personalities because we can battle all day long and we can look at the one and say, well, this candidate here, uh, they're just a crook, okay? Uh, in fact, they should be in jail. They should be sentenced to jail and they are, are a liar and all sorts of things are being said. Then we can go to the other one and say, this one is so belligerently ignorant. And the public testimony of... Um, those of the other sex and, and the statements come out of his mouth of disrespect. Oh, we can go on all day, right? Okay, so both of them are public trash buckets. Okay, so we're going to forget about that. You have to choose your battles. But you don't throw in the towel because it's a discouraging situation. Amen? So we have to choose our battles. So the battle in which we have to choose is stop looking at personalities, and we have to look at policies. But today, we're not talking politics. What's politics? How big should our military be? How much money should we be spending on them? That's politics. Politics. Should we have open borders and let all the immigrants come running into our country with open arms, or should we build a wall? Politics. Should we head into socialism? Politics. Where should we spend our money? I mean, we, we can go on all day long about uh, all the political decisions that need to be made. We're not going there. We got bigger issues. Let's choose our battles as a believer and stand for that in which we believe. This is uh, Veterans Weekend. And let's see, I, I know they're honoring you. The, uh, the, let's see, all those here in Dad the Cafe, just real quick, raise your hand. You've served in the armed forces, some sort of service, okay? Uh, praise God for you. I did not do that. But in honor for those who willingly signed up for a service knowing that they could have died, and for over one million men who shed their blood, average age of these men were in their early 20s, gave away their lives so that we can enjoy the freedom that we have in this country. There is a God in heaven. His blessing's been upon us. We need to honor him, and we need to honor them. Amen? We need to do our part. We need to vote. We don't throw in and say, it's hopeless. There's nothing I can do. I don't like the choices. So we're going to, you know, we're going to let the baby go down with the bathwater. We're just going to tra trash it all. Whatever happens, happens. I don't care. Please don't do that. During World War II, when England was being bombed by the Nazis and the people were absolutely beside themselves and losing hope, the English sent a message to Prime Minister Winston Churchill, and he said, it's now time to surrender. They made it through that night, but the reason why they did, he sent a message back, and he said, victory is not won by evacuation. Who do you vote for? It's not who you vote for. It's how you should vote. Is God a Republican or is he a Democrat? Don't answer that question. I know you got some strong beliefs on that. Okay, let's go to Joshua chapter 5, verse 13. Okay, you know the story, Jericho, the walls come tumbling down at Jericho, and the enemy was just too big. And uh, Judy, it's good seeing you in church. I just saw you in church. We talked about your husband last week. Craig went home to be with the Lord. It's so nice seeing you with us. And um, okay, so here they're in the midst of a battle, and as they are going into this, Joshua was a little concerned, and that night he takes a little prayer walk by himself, and all of a sudden he comes upon a man. Look what it says here in verse 13. Now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and he saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Okay, now this is of great concern because no man on his team would have a drawn sword, sword looking at Joshua. He, he's the chief. 
So look what he says. Joshua said, went up to him and he asked, are you for us or are you for our enemy? God, who are you for? Are you, are you for us? Are you for, are you for the Democrats? Are you for the Republicans? Are you for the independents? And look what he says. Neither, he said, but as a commander of the Lord, the army of the Lord, I have now come. God is not on one side or the other side of the political process. He is for his side. So I'm not asking you to join any one side. We're going to tell you who to vote for. We're just telling you to join God's side. It's the philosophy of belief that is very strong and powerful that we find in the Word of God. And you say, well, how do I do this? You need to know, and you'll want to jot this down, you need to know his will, his priorities, his morality, through his inspired Word. And then you vote accordingly. Do you catch that? If you know what his will is, if you know what his priorities are, if you know what his morality is, because his will is to be my will, and his priorities are to be my priorities, and his morality is to be my morality. Why? Because he loved me. The Lord Jesus Christ came to this earth, and he willingly gave his life away from me, and he shed his blood so that I could have eternal life. And I'm to live for him, and I'm to work for him, and I am to serve him, and I'm to stand for him, and I'm to let everybody know that I'm a child of the true king. Doesn't make any difference who becomes the president of this United States. Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, he is still king. And you take that with you to the voting polls. We don't sit in a corner and fold our hands and say, well, there's nothing I can do. That's what cowards do, and we are not cowards. And you're not a coward. And you're not a coward in other areas of your life. We have to do our duty and we have to do our responsibility. And let me tell you what is very disturbing here. Um, there are ministries that I love and they preach the word of God. And they're on the radio and you love them and you care for them. And they're doing a good work for the Lord. There's some television ministries that are out there and they're doing a great job that are serving God. They are saying nothing about this. In fact, they've had the gall to come out and to say, well, we're not going to stand behind this one candidate because we don't like their lifestyle or how they speak. But they're giving no guidance, and the church is sending the American Christian into derision, feeling as if there's nobody that they can vote for. So many people have chosen to take the coward's way out, or they've joined the enemy's team. And they're joining up with those that are against God's will, do not have God's priority. They have no morality. And that is not what God wants us to do. Now, I want to look here. Let's talk about the, um, why this is so important. One of the reasons why this is so important, whoever becomes the president of the United States is going to appoint, if they stay for two terms, which most of the time they do, they're going to appoint at least five Supreme Justices to the Supreme Court. Uh, they used not to be in charge. But now, they think they are the foundation and the government is the foundation of the home. The Supreme Justice have came forward and, in liberal views in now saying that we have same-sex marriage. The reason why this is important to us as Christians, the direction of what's going to happen with same-sex marriage, even deeper, and transgender rights, and gay rights, when it comes to the subject matter of abortion, when it comes to the stripping away of religious freedom and tax exemption, is all going to be in the hands of a liberal Supreme Court. And anyone who would aid that to take place in the future is as guilty as the people that are going to make those votes. It won't be long if the Supreme Court goes liberal. And just so you know right now, Bible preaching churches and good moral people are bad people here in America. We are haters. We are mean. We are cruel. And the day is going to come at the church when a church refuses to do a gay marriage, they're going to strip away our tax exemption. It hasn't happened yet, but if the Supreme Court goes liberal, it's going to take place. 
let's talk about what's the difference between conservative and liberal. Because some people think, well, you know, if you're a liberal, you're just like this open arms, I love everybody, and that's why we have so many Christians that are heading in that direction. Okay, let's talk about this. And, and this is a given. This is well known by everyone. First of all, a conservative believes a man and a woman in marriage only, and that the family is the foundation. Liberals, this is in politics now, believe anyone in love makes up a family and the government is the foundation. Conservatives believe in the protection of unborn life. Liberals oppose any laws at all, restriction, restricting abortion. And one of our candidates had made it very clear. On one end, they'll say, I love children. They talk about children. Oh, we're going to do this for the children. But when asked, would you put any restrictions on abortion coming right up to almost the very end there? Uh, no, no, huh? The problem. Conservatives oppose Planned Parenthood selling aborted baby parts. We are into an American holocaust of the murder of millions and millions of children. And now we've stepped to a whole new low of selling the baby, baby parts of what they say are not babies, but we're selling their parts. Liberals continue to support Planned Parenthood and put absolutely no restrictions on the sale of aborted baby parts. God is pro-life from the womb to the tomb. And there's no way getting around that. Listen, we can differ from Obamacare. We can differ on the military. We can differ on the borders. We can differ on immigration. But we cannot bend. We cannot compromise. We cannot dilute our beliefs and give in one inch for the unborn child. There is a God in heaven. And if we love him, and we believe in him, and we believe in his word, then we have to follow him. You cannot wear a political hat and a Christian hat. Many of you come to church, say, I love Jesus. I love Jesus. My name is the book of life. I believe in the second coming of Jesus. But then when you go to the voting polls, you whip off the Christian hat and you take the political hat and you put it on and say, well, this is politics. Who taught you that? There is no political hat. There's one hat that you're a believer at the job, in the home, on the street, in church, and also at the polls. What if an elderly woman was walking down the street and you saw a mugger jumping on her? Is it okay to do this? Well, I'm not seeing. I'm not watching. I don't think, I mean, it's not my fault. I didn't do that. That's what we do when we turn our backs on abortion. What you can do, the little bit you can do, is not only speak it, to vote, but to vote accordingly and to let God know, I'm against that. I'm for you, and I'm for life, and I am against that. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 7. Why is it that so many Christians have been so deluded? Why is it that we have a local church. And again, I'll never say it. Figure it out yourself. Very large here in the city of Pittsburgh, which has gone liberal in beliefs because of this. Bible church. Second Peter chapter 2 verse 7. Just remember Sodom and Gomorrah right before God destroyed it. Lot and his family were deluded by the filth of this word world. Because of this, he lost his wife. Horrible, horrible things happened to his daughters. It says, just Lot was worn down with the filthy lifestyle, the wicked, that the righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing wore down his righteous soul from day to day. The reason why believers, all believers, should believe in the morality taught in God's word. But the reason why we have become so liberal in our thinking is you have been deluded and hurt and polluted, and wore down by what you're seeing, what you're hearing, what you're listening to. Remember in the Civil War? Imagine during the Civil War between the North and the South. Imagine a soldier running with a blue coat and gray pants. That's what a lot of Christians are doing. I love Jesus, but then we join the world. What should we do? What, what, what's the problem here? As believers... God is not in charge of any party. 
And there is no party that is Christian. So what we have to do is we have to vote in such a way of policies that honors and draws, draws us as a nation closer to him. Or is the real reason why we, the vote, way we vote is that I'm going to honor me. There's something I want. You know, I want my wife to have good medical care. You want to be sure you have your social security there. My friend, we've got bigger problems than that. You have to choose your battles. We have to forget about ourselves. We have to put God first. We have to clearly let him know. When it comes to morality and the most important things, of the, not just as Christians, but to God, that we stand for. Because God is the one. Did you ever wonder why God blessed America? Do you, know, do you ever wonder why we're not like some of these other nations? His judgment is coming. Revelation chapter 6, verse 15. It says, and when Jesus comes, I talked about that last week. Hey, I'm going to tell you something. I'm not a fireball about politics. I vote the way I should vote. I speak the way in which I should speak. I have very strong political views, but my strong political views are a sideline because I know the real battles in which I have to stand for, and I'd be willing to give up all the other political views to be sure that I am morally right according to God's word. But Jesus is coming, and the Bible tells that the rapture of the church is going to take place. And, and look what it says here in Philippians 3.20. But our citizenship is in heaven. Amen? That's who our citizens of. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not just Jesus Christ. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are to bow our knees as believers in this life and make him the Lord of our lives, that we're going to obey him. Who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, talking about this earth, he will, will transform our lowly bodies so that we will be like his glorious body. As I come to the close of this service, before I read the last passage, I want to be sure you understand something. And I'll continue this next week. I've got a very exciting Sunday. It has nothing to do with politics, but it's very, very exciting. It's just amen on that one. No politics. Amen. Okay, I got one Sunday we talk about this. But... When Jesus returns and the trumpet sounds, all believers are going to disappear off the face of this earth. Our bodies will be transformed and be made into like his. You see, our job as believers is to look like him, to think like him, to talk like him, to speak like him, to think like him as much as we can before he comes. And if you're a lot like Jesus and what's on his heart is on your heart, and that you're a man after God's own heart. You're a woman after God's own heart. If that all takes place. And the Bible says that you're going to go to the beam of judgment seat of Christ. And the Bible says he's going to hand out rewards. I know you don't understand the rewards. But I want to be sure you get this right. We're coming back just some years later with Jesus. And we're coming back to the earth. And when we come back to the earth, the Bible says that Jesus is going to set up his kingdom. You already know this. We've been praying. Thy kingdom come, right? Do you know what that's about? The Bible says that he's going to come here. He's going to make it like a garden of Eden. He's going to take the earth and it's all going to be brought under his subjection. Now, how much you love him, for how much you stand for him, for how much you give to him, for how much you speak for him, how much you live for him, you are going to give, give be given a place in his, his government. Because the Bible says he has kings and he has queens. And he has mayors, and he has delegates, and he has senators, and they come down the line. And where you are placed is how much you loved and you lived for him. If I was you, I'd be a little more concerned about your political position in the future. Some of these people you have aligned yourself with, it's bad. I don't care what reasoning they give. And if you're not a Christian, I understand. And you just go do whatever you do because that's the way you think. But if you're a Christian, do the right thing. Now look with me, last passage, Revelation chapter 6. Um, President Obama needs to hear this. Clinton needs to hear this. Trump needs to hear it. That's the only time I'm bringing our names up. All of them need to hear this very clearly. All of our delegates, the Supreme Court needs to hear this. Our public officials here in the city of Pittsburgh need to hear this. One day Jesus is going to come, and we're going to be riding in horses behind him after the rapture to come set up his kingdom, and they are going to run 
for their lives. Look what it says. Then the kings, all politics, all politicians of this earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, uh, that's all the movie stars and all the rest of them, the mighty, those who think they're so tough, and everyone else, both slave and free, they hid. They're going to hide in the caves. They're going to be in the rocks of the mountains. And they're going to call out to the mountain and the rocks. And they're going to say, please, fall on us. They'll wish they could commit suicide. And it would just bring their lives to an end. But no life ever comes to an end. Hide us from the face of him who sits on that throne. And from the wrath of the lamb. And that lamb is the Lord Jesus Christ. For the great day of their wrath has come. I got news for you. Jesus is coming back to the earth. And boy, is he mad. And you think about that. As you do your responsibility and your duty as an American. I'm not here to argue with anybody. It's not in me. I mean, I care about America. I care about my children. I care about their future. My would-be future grandchildren, but... I got my eyes on the kingdom. I care more about that. Let us do what God has called us to do. And remember what the billboard has said down at the bottom of the street. That's our billboard. It doesn't make any difference who's elected president. The Lord Jesus Christ, he's still king. Amen? Our Heavenly Father, as we now come before you. Oh, Father, we're not here to talk about politics. We're not here to talk about candidates. Father, what we're here to talk about is you. We love you, and we thank you, and we praise you that you loved us. We thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, that you died on the cross so that we could have eternal life. You're not only our Savior, but right now you're our Lord. And what moves your heart today? We want that to move our hearts. We pray for the unborn child. Father, we want to let you know that we're not aligning ourselves with murderers. We're not voting for anyone. We're not bending we're not voting in that direction. We will have no parts of it. But Father, we pray for all these candidates. We pray that your will would be accomplished. And that we thank you for this in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.